Hi, this is Scott. I really appreciate our sponsors because they make the show possible. Today's show is sponsored by Telerik. Create compelling app experiences across any screen with the Telerik platform. Telerik's end-to-end platform uniquely combines industry-leading UI tools with cloud services to simplify the entire app development cycle. Telerik offers everything .NET developers need to build quality apps faster. Try it free at Telerik.com slash platform. That's Telerik.com slash platform. From HanselMinutes.com, it's Hansel Minutes, a weekly discussion with web developer and technologist Scott Hanselman. This is Lawrence Ryan announcing show number 519. In this episode, Scott talks with electrical engineer Laura Hughes from Arrow.com. Hi, this is Scott Hansel, and this is another episode of Hansel Minutes. Today, I'm talking with Laura Hughes. She's an electrical engineer, and she works at Aero. How are you? Doing great. How are you, Scott? I am having all sorts of fun. It's March is for maker, uh, makers right now, and I'm, I'm actually running all over the Aero.com website looking for gadgets, and uh, you guys have a bunch of stuff. Is this a website for makers, or is this a website for people who are in industrial design, or what, what's going on here? All of the above. We definitely started as more placing an order of 10,000 pieces. We used to say, if you need a million of something, you go directly to the supplier. If you need 10,000, you come to us. Um, But now we're taking a big initiative to make this more friendly to the makerspace. So everything that's coming into inventory is now available in quantity of one. You don't have to buy a hundred of anything anymore. And we're trying to sign with all kinds of people like Adafruit just got added to our line card. We have Arduinos, all sorts of maker stuff. Oh, cool. And I also noticed that for March, uh, it's free shipping. So anything that's a uh, hundred bucks or $99 or more. And so if you decide to load up, if you're building a robot or something, uh, you can say free March and you get free mm-hmm. shipping in the US, which is pretty sweet. Absolutely. And definitely stay tuned this month. We're going to be running a couple other promotions as well. All right. Very cool. So, so you're uh, an electrical engineer. When did you have your first, uh, kind of LED moment where you, you, you made something happen and you knew it was for you? So I was actually eight. I was in third grade and we had just done circuits course in, I guess, our little science unit of elementary school. Mm -hmm. And I had, I had gotten pulled out for something. And so when I came in to take the test, I failed it. So my dad is an electrical engineer. So I went home with that and he's like, all right, we got to get this right. So he sat down and we drew it on paper. We talked about how if a circuit is going to turn on a light, it has to complete itself. And Mm -hmm. then he found me some wire and an LED and a battery and sat down and had me connect it up. And that was my LED moment. And it was like, oh my God, it's just a circle. (laughs) If I can make a circle, I can make anything happen. So that was my first LED moment. Um, Honestly, some of the bigger ones though happened in the last couple of years when I was in the lighting design team for Arrow. I realized just how much light you can get out of some of the new LEDs, right? We're talking about the chip on board that have tens of thousands of lumens that's a whole other kind of light bulb moment. This is, forgive me, I'm going to ask a lot of ignorant questions because my EE experience consists of making a clock during the required EE courses that I took to do <laughs> software engineering. So I took a different path and went down the software engineering uh, direction. Um, is there, how much power loss is there? You know, if you have like, uh, you know, a, a 1.5 volt battery and you've got half a half an amp, um, how much light can you get out of there and how much, how much is lost? You know what I mean? Cause there were, there's been lots of different ways to light things up and it keeps, are we, are we bringing light from another dimension? Cause some of these LEDs are so bright. They, uh, they're almost impossible. Exactly. And so it really depends when you're dealing with the more modern surface mount designed to get a whole lot of lumen out packages. Mm-hmm. Typically you're looking at a hundred lumens per watt. And that is pretty much the best you can do. And that is without any electrical losses or optical losses, anything like that. So, and honestly, out of the chip, we usually say you can get about 70% of light out. You're still going to lose 30% to heat, which is why you see LED systems with such giant heat sinks on them. Because incandescent bulbs, you want to heat that up in order to keep producing more light. That's how they work, Mm. which makes it really interesting when you're trying to retrofit like cans in the ceiling and stuff, because 
heat is the enemy of LEDs, so you have to somehow get that out into the ceiling. Interesting. So I thought, I- ignorantly, that LEDs didn't really have much heat. Is it just that they don't have much heat compared to other light sources like incandescent and fluorescent? Absolutely that. So incandescent, you're looking at 5 to 10% efficient. You're getting 10% at best light to 90% heat which is why they get so hot if you've ever tried to change a light bulb too quickly well, after turning it off. <laughs> I had no idea. So LED, and incandescent light bulbs are just little heaters. They're not really much yes. light as a, a secondary. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so the fact that an LED is even 70% efficient is a huge deal. Oh, wow. Seven, okay, so 70% efficient. So there is a little bit of heat, but uh, mm-hmm. they can be used. Like I know when I got some CFLs, you know, the complex fluorescence, mm-hmm. there's always a warning that says, don't put it in a can, don't put it in a, in a compact, in an enclosed space. I, right. I can do that with an LED, though. It's still not great for it, but it is still easier to use that way than a CFL. Just because the CFL, say it's 40% efficient, it's going to be generating a lot more heat than even an LED bulb. Mm-hmm. So, And it seems how f- it's so fast that LEDs like, took over the world. Like It seems like just a couple of months ago, I finally converted all of my old incandescent bulbs to CFLs, and now everyone's saying I need to switch over to LEDs because CFLs aren't good for the environment. That is true. I know. Yeah, they really did kind of come out of nowhere. It's a huge blossoming industry. And there are so many applications for it, right? You can do so many different things from even street lighting. It's easier to control them. They have no downtime. So in stadiums, right, that's a big one because you can immediately turn them on if the power goes out. With the halogen bulbs, you actually have to wait several minutes for them to come back up. And you can dim an LED? That's Is that allowed? Mm, so that gets interesting. You can absolutely dim them, but it's harder to do them with an incandescent bulb. With incandescent, you just reduce the power into it. With an LED, you're PWMing the input. So if you try to do that, yeah, sorry, pulse width, wow, pulse width modulate, you're turning it on and off very quickly. And the amount in a cycle that you have it on dictates how bright it is. So if you say you have a 90% duty cycle, it's on 90% of the time and off 10% of the time, and it's going to be about 90% of its maximum brightness. So dimming is a lie? We're flashing it? You're flashing it. Oh my God, that explains. I know. That's crazy. Which is why you'll see people like movie producers refuse to go to LED because it's possible you can get a refresh rate that somehow synchronizes with your camera rate. So you can actually get flicker with LEDs because they are. They are turning on and off really quickly. Oh, and that's why when I take a picture of my screen with my digital camera, sometimes I can see waves going over it because they're, uh, there's the refresh rate of the camera on my phone and the refresh rate of the of the screen, and they're exactly. near each other. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Mm-hmm. You know, there's so much fun stuff like this that you learn. Like you're teaching me things here, and I'm 40 plus years old, and I'm going... You just filled in a, a gap, you know what I mean? Like a, a Tetris piece of knowledge just dropped down and snapped into place, and then a bunch of things get explained. Uh, one of the fun things I like to do when I do science classes for kids is uh, you show them a remote control with an IR little thing, mm-hmm. and you say, can you see it? You can't see it, can you? But then you point it at a, at a digital camera or any kind of video camera, and then they can actually see the light. And mm-hmm. and when they learn that... like. A remote control is just a fancy flashlight. Like, brains explode. <laughs> That's very, very true. I, at least my brain exploded. I, I find that to be so interesting. Like, the idea that all we're doing, like, like you could sit there with a switch and just turn it on and off really fast and change the channel mm-hmm. if you were, you know, if you could do that 60 times a second, and that would be really awesome. Right. Do you go and teach at any kind of schools or do any kind of like STEM education things when you uh, on, on either by yourself or on behalf of Arrow? Well, right now we're actually helping out a little bit with um, a high school girls engineering club, and they are participating in the Shell car competition. So I actually just started talking with them. They just finished their carbon fiber shell, and they are ready to get started on the motor system. So that's going to be really interesting. Hmm. Um, and then we're doing Steam Fest, which is STEM with arts in it. And then we're also doing Maker Fair in May. Wow. So, so a lot, it sounds like. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. And um, do you, when, when you see a new person, like the people who are listening to the show and thinking about like marches for makers, and they show up mm-hmm. to a 
a website like Adafruit or like Arrow.com and they see a bunch of things. Like here, I just decided to show up and I see DM320003, blah, 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 blah. but I see USB starter kit. I'm like, I look like this looks like some kind of chip that does some kind of thing. And it says starter kit, but I still have no idea what it does. Sometimes the onboarding can be a little bit overwhelming. How do I, how do I get involved if I don't know what all of these um, three letter acronyms are? So one of the best kept secrets is that none of us actually know most of what's on our website, right? And that's what comes from being a part of a distributor like this. None of us quite know. Uh So honestly, you just learn how to learn, right? Um, We have a lot of resources to help you. We've got the engineers that can live chat with you right away. We've got 180 or something that you can email and ask questions to. Um, But we do try to Make sure every data sheet is online. And we actually have data sheets for everything, even that we don't sell. So it's a good place to start, even if you have a starter kit from somewhere else. But right, if you wanted to open up the starter kit, you can check out the data sheet. We have a lot of reference designs that may already be using that. So it can help you get up and running with that pretty quickly. Yeah, I'm I'm learning about data sheets. Uh, They're obvious, of course, if people are electrical engineers. But when you're just kind of getting started making, uh, uh, they're a little bit overwhelming. But uh, mostly I've been focusing on, you know, pinouts and voltage. So, for example, I'm trying to uh, work with a little tool. What is this thing called? I'm reaching over on my desk here. Some kind of a deal. It's a um, a gyroscope, right? Ooh. And the data sheet, the data, you know, I, want, I want to do a thing where I can, um, it'll tell when my garage door opens. I've been, this is my kind of go-to project. So, I make it mm-hmm. multiple times in multiple ways to see if I can learn more and more. So, you tape it to the garage, the garage door opens, and then it th- that is a difference in orientation. Um, the, gyro- the, the gyroscope here has this amazingly complicated data sheet, but uh, it's only got like six, <laughs> like five or six pins on it. So, I'm trying to see if I can get away with just using one or two pages of the, of the data sheet. Are, are, is reading this kind of stuff something that you learn in engineering school or is this something that, that people can pick up? It is not something we covered in school. And I think it would have been great if we did, but it is something you just learn what is important for every product family, right? Mm-hmm. The first thing we always go to is the absolute maximum ratings. Usually that's a nice little chart in there somewhere. Mm. And that that's just always great to keep in the back of your mind, right? Because even with LEDs, if you're doing something and you happen to give it a little bit too much current, too much voltage, and it dies on you, it's good to know why or prevent that in the first place. So honestly, usually that, and like you said, the pinout, that tends to be what you need to know. More and more, I'm seeing data sheets give you a typical application circuit, which is so helpful because it shows you where to put all the little capacitors and resistors that the chip needs to work, but you just don't know that off the top of your head. So that's always very handy. That's a good thing um, to know about it. I didn't realize that it, I would be more likely to use something that had a data sheet that said, and here's a typical way that you would wire this up with other things. Typical application would be extremely useful. Absolutely. I was just in power supply design. That was something we did all the time because you have all these different chips that seem to do about the same thing. So it really, it's to the chips supplier's advantage if you have multiple application circuits in there to say, here's how you do 50 watts, 200 watts, a kilowatt, mm-hmm. and help you out with the part selection there. Hey folks, I wanted to take a moment to tell you about Raygun and their new product called Pulse. Raygun is an error and crash reporting software provider, and their new product, Pulse, it's a real-time user monitoring product. It gives you performance data and user insights. It lets you understand exactly what's happening when users interact with your software, so you're never left guessing. Raygun provides you with the answers to your performance questions, and they've found over 10 billion, that's billion with a B, bugs in customer apps with their crash reporting product. And now Raygun will help you understand application quality like no one else. Over 30,000 developers worldwide can't be wrong. I use Raygun all the time and I enjoy it very much. You can try it out today with a no-risk 30-day free trial. Start improving your software quality immediately. Try Raygun for free today at raygun.io. I was working on a project with my nephew and we mostly have the LEDs that have the long leg and the short leg. Mm -hmm. And uh, then he saw a thing here on the site called a light, an optical light pipe. Okay. Are you familiar with this? I am. So there's a couple different things that end up called a light pipe, Mm -hmm. but 
really what it is, is um, just a fiber optic. And it's funny you bring this up because we actually did this in one of our lunch and learns in our lab at Arrow. Mm -hmm. We made little lightsabers that were essentially light pipes. We took acrylic tubing, sanded up the edges so that the light would diffuse out of it, and then glued an LED to the end. And it did exactly that. If you looked at it before you sanded it up, you would see the light right through the end, but it wouldn't come out the sides at all. So a light pipe is really just a diffuse acrylic tube, but they have special ways of making them so you can get them that are bendy. I've seen them as balloon strings, which is pretty crazy. They're very, very fun. They're a little bit like EL wire, if you've ever seen that. Um, and, but and how is that different from fiber optic? It's rough on the edges. Like when, you know, you know when you see those little, like kind of like it's like a like a group of is it EL wire or is it that's a group of flowers, almost like a bunch of flowers where the tips are all lit up? Is that fiber optics or is that EL that's wire? It's fiber optic, and you can usually tell the difference because you can only see the light at the very end. You don't uh -huh. see the light emitting all the way through the tube. EL or well, EL wire, but also the light pipes are pretty good about dispersing all the way through. Typically, those are actually what you use when you're making a box and have a circuit board with some surface mount LEDs on it. And then you need to get that light up to the top of your surface. So those are just little short tubes that operate a lot like giant fiber optics. They don't want to disperse the light through it, but that's how you use it in the real world. But light pipes are really fun if you scratch them up because then you can make lightsabers. Uh, you have me at lightsabers. That's that sounds brilliant. <laughs> yeah, I've been I've been finding messing with all the different things that are available to make light. Like you know, you initially start out, mm -hmm. you make that LED blink, and then you learn that you know EL wire or electroluminescent wire exists, and then that becomes something exciting that you can do. And now now that you're telling me that I can scratch up a light pipe and make a lightsaber, that's pretty awesome. Um, what about these LED strips? Um, you can mm -hmm. buy them on a roll. Absolutely. So we actually just used a bunch of those in our cornhole video, if anybody's seen that. And the big strip was just plugged into a battery, but one of the smaller ones, even though it's 12 volt, we were able to control it with an Arduino. We just used a little N2, well, 2N2222, which is a simple uh, BJT. You can use What's a MOSFET. What's a BJT? A bipolar, oh gosh, junction transistor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry, gotta ask. Quiz gotta ask. Um, and all it does is operate as a little switch. So it can make, I, I describe it as the actual brain. Your arm won't independently move. It needs a brain to send a tiny little signal to it mm -hmm. in order to move the large thing that is your arm. So that's what the Arduino can do. It can send a little signal to this gate and the switch will open or close and allow power to flow through. So that's how we made it flash. We had the Arduino say, okay, turn this pin on and off five times. And because we had that going to the gate of the transistor, when that went high, the switch closed and we were able to connect the 12 volts to a 12 volt source. So it actually was able to be controlled through an Arduino, which is pretty neat. Now, these uh, these long strips of LEDs, I've used them in costumes and stuff, but is mm -hmm. it true that there are ones where you can individually address an LED within the longer strip? Absolutely. Those are the Adafruit NeoPixels, and we just started carrying them. I'm really excited. I actually have a roll on my desk right now that I'm going to go play with after this. And it's really, truly brilliant how they did it. Each chip has its own little brain to it, so it only takes... I think six control lines for the entire strip and you can make any single LED do any kind of effect. So you can do kind of color chasing, changing. I'm sure you could, I well do any kind of effect. What, very, is that, what does that mean? A control line, six control lines? Cause you sound impressed by that and I want to be impressed also. I am. So typically when you have a single um, RGB, red, green, blue LED in one package, mm -hmm. you have three lines. Well, four lines. You have a ground, and then you have one that you can use to control how much red, how much green, and how much blue. Oh, sorry. The light bulb just went on. Like, not, no pun intended. So, <laughs> four wires, ground, and then red, green, blue, and then yes. zero to 255, effectively. Exactly. So, that's if you have a single RGB LED like comes in an Arduino kit, that's usually how you control it. Okay. So, then you think about if you wanted to control a roll of however many are on there, a hundred LEDs. You kind of think, oh gosh, am I going to have a hundred reds, a hundred greens, a hundred blues? But no, the way that they did it, it's, it's very clever. You give each one of them an address and basically from the Arduino, you're just kind of shouting down the line and say, Hey, OXAAFF, 
do this. And you kind of get the LEDs to play telephone. Like if the first one is not AAFF, it's like, I don't know, I'm going to keep passing this message down. And then when it gets to the right LED, it does something. Uh, okay. So they are, it's, it's, it is, it is message passing. It's duck, duck, goose LED style. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what it is. Uh, okay. So if it's for me, I keep it and otherwise I pass it along to the next person. Exactly. And it's just a very clever way to do it because, yeah, if you think about all those anodes and cathodes trying to control them, that gets really ugly really quickly. Interesting. So then they've got, you said six lines then. So let me... That's ground and then three for the color and then two that represent the address that can be passed down. Probably. I can't, probably. I'm not actually sure how these work. I haven't plugged them in yet. They probably go off the spy line. So one is probably data and one is probably clock. Oh. And that just helps keep it all synchronized so that you're not sending things asynchronously. And then the, the result of all of this is that the, the one in the first one in the line is still going to come on at the same speed as the one at the end of the line. For all intents and purposes. For all intents and purposes. Given I the bet speed of you, light and all that. Exactly. <laughs> I bet if you put a scope probe on it, you would see them turn on at different times, uh -huh. but our eyes have no idea. It moves so fast. And these things are becoming like really cheap. Like I've seen uh, like, you know, 10, 15 years ago, if someone had custom LED lighting in their, you know, their quote unquote home theater room, you'd mm -hmm. say that's a pretty fancy person with a lot of money. But uh, now you can buy these pretty inexpensively. And I've seen people put in mood lighting that changes mm -hmm. with the color of what's going on on the screen. Oh, like remember that Philips Ambilight, the ambient light? It was a a way of, of having you know, if the, if the Incredible Hulk's on the screen, then you've got green coming outside. The, the imagine if your whole room did that. Oh, that would be so fun! And all you need is a color sensor. Can you get on that and make that happen for us? I Aaron? can make that happen. I'm going to write that down. Isn't that cool? Will you watch the video if I, would, I make it happen? I would tell everyone <laughs> about it, and I would make it. I want to. Basically, what I want is like if if the Hulk's towards the top of the screen, you know, mm -hmm. then that's the, so the top of the screen is predominantly green. Then the whole whole room gets green, and then it's got to fade in, right? So as the colors are changing, the whole room's got to change. Uh, color. Oh my goodness. I want to watch the Avengers right now with my living oh my room gosh. pulsing in color, huh? Yes. Yes. I, oh, that'd be amazing. oh my gosh. Yeah. I think the Philips, you know, there's the Philips Hue, which is like a smart light bulb, has some basic things, but they make it too complicated. I think we can do this ourselves <laughs> without the internet. <laughs> Oh, we can. Oh my goodness, we could make this IoT connected. Oh, this could be fun. Okay, this is amazing. See, now we've got a we've got a project now for March, and we're we're only halfway through March. So this is this is fantastic. This is fantastic. When does the next Avengers come out? We can definitely have it done by then. Okay, right? there you go. Let's we'll aim. Yeah, we'll aim for Captain America: Civil War, and uh, that'll be awesome. Oh, there you go. Okay, that's yeah. cool. <laughs> but any anyway, but it, it's amazing what you can do. With just an Arduino, right? You can get mm -hmm. the color sensor. We have those everywhere. Put them somewhere. Mm -hmm. You can control all the... I mean, even if you didn't want to do them individually addressable, you can control the color of even those really cheap strip lights you get off Amazon mm -hmm. for nothing. You could control all those, and they are pretty bright. I use them as underlighting. I actually have them in the shower because, hey, who wouldn't want multicolored waterproof lights? Are, they can be done waterproof. That was my first question. Like you, first, my thinking: you have a death wish. You have a death wish. You have <laughs> LEDs in your in your shower. But ultimately, there are things like that. You would keep the power. You keep the wires outside the shower, and then the yes. strip enters the shower, and it's waterproof from that point. Yes, that is something to be very careful of. Don't try to plug live wires into the shower, please. <laughs> that is that is how you die. <laughs> <laughs> interesting. So that brings me up to an interesting question. So you, 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 there's one project you have in your house. Are you doing that? Are you thinking about ways you can integrate uh, electronics into making your life easier? What other projects around the house have you done? Oh, absolutely. Um, it's it kind of becomes an obsession, doesn't it? As soon as you realize, oh, I could do something about that, you, you have to figure out how to do it, even if the project is probably more expensive than just buying the solution. But most of mine are lighting related. Mm -hmm. I, I absolutely love lighting. So I have addressable strips everywhere in the house. Um, a couple motorized things. We're actually going to do a quick video coming up around Pi Day, um, how to make a an apple pie with a power supply. So a lot of use of motors and stuff like that. Um, and honestly, just taking things apart and making them a little bit easier to use. I've definitely ripped apart things like an alarm clock and put a capacitive sensor on it and stuff. So when you hit it, you don't have to actually hit the button to make it stop making that horrible noise. You just Ooh, hit the that's a good one. foil, right? So you, See, could, it's a good you one. could retrofit something because ultimately you're trying to slap the snooze button. <laughs> right. But ultimately, if you exactly. just slap the thing itself and it could feel mm -hmm. that you hit it, then that would activate the snooze button. 
Exactly. Yeah, that's a really great thing for people who are listening, right? Making and, and celebrating marches for makers doesn't necessarily have to be building something from scratch. It can be changing the behavior of something you already have. Right. Because honestly, so many good ideas are already out there, but it's so satisfying to take something apart and say, this is what I really wish it could do. And now it does that because these changes don't have to be big. They can be adding lights or speakers or changing the way a button moves. That's really the easiest way to get into it, right? Take apart what you already have. Mm -hmm. Now you mentioned something about color sensors. Uh, Mm -hmm. Are those, are those big things or small things? What, what, what's the size of that? Cause my, my son and I just put together a, uh, a Lego Rubik's cube solver and it has a little Uh color sensor and it looks at each square on the Rubik's cube and has to scan it before, before it does it. Is that like an LED in reverse? That is exactly what it is. Yep. So a regular RGB LED has three little strips that emit red, green, and blue. The sensor just has photosensitive strips for the same colors. And wouldn't it need to have some kind of uh, illumination, like a white illumination LED to make it really clear, like a white balance almost? Like there's different, like as ambient light, I would think would make it so you couldn't tell what color something was. It does make a big difference. So the cheaper ones don't have that kind of balancing and they work the way you would assume based on that. Mm -hmm. The really good ones, yes, they do have a separate white LED and they know exactly what kind of white it is Mm -hmm. because ultimately with LEDs, you can only emit so many wavelengths, right? So it's usually a blue LED that's coated in a phosphor that makes it look white. So if they know the properties of that phosphor, they can know exactly what wavelengths they're putting out. So they know exactly how to interpret what's coming back. Ah, okay, interesting. And I, I'm also learning as I'm as we're talking. I'm learning about this. I see that there's color sensors here on the site that also are smart about IR. Apparently, ambient infrared mm-hmm. light that's around can throw these things off. So if you're in an environment where you're trying to sense color and someone's got remote controls or can't, you know. or you're outside. <laughs> oh gosh, I forgot about that because isn't that that is the outside, isn't it? It's just one big yes. giant infrared thing. That's exactly where that comes into play. Oh, interesting. So that's a huge problem then, like sunlight messes with these things. Sunlight is wreaks havoc on sensors. It's pretty funny. It, you would think it would help to have that much light around, but it, it really, really confuses things from IR sensors to color sensors to even trying to do beam break sensors. Uh-huh. Now, when you're plugging in your LEDs and your different projects, you mentioned Arduino a couple of times, and we've mm-hmm. been doing some projects uh, this month with Arduinos. Uh, do you need, like, do you just plug the LEDs directly into the uh, Arduino, or do you use a, is it called a relay to control that? Or what's the way to manage the power requirements of the LED versus what the Arduino is able to put out? Sure. So the fact that the Arduino has limited current outputs actually makes it really nice because it's really hard to explode your LEDs. Uh, because even though they have a 3.3 volt output and your LED probably wants less voltage than that, you would normally need to use a resistor and you probably still should. But if you do plug it directly between a digital pin and ground on the Arduino, it's not going to blow up. It'll just only give it so many milliamps. That is not true <laughs> if you're using a power source that you plug into the wall. So if you have like a 5 volt power supply, you definitely want to make sure to put the correct resistors in there. Uh, but yeah, you can turn it on and off with a relay. You can use a BJT like we talked about. That's the cheap and easy way to do it. If you were doing anything really big or AC, you would need to use a relay, definitely. Mm-hmm. Now, one of the things that people who have told me who've got it started with things like Arduinos is like, well, it works really great when it's plugged into my computer, but I don't have a power strategy for it outside of my mm. computer. I've seen people use 9-volt batteries. Uh, mm-hmm. I've seen people try to buy, you know, um, plug-in wall things. But I understand that the word is LiPo, lithium poly batteries. Is that right? Mm-hmm. And these little these little batteries are like, they're, they're like, you know, smaller than your palm, quite small. Mm-hmm. How long can these run LEDs? Are these something I can run for weeks or are we just talking about a day or so? We're definitely talking about weeks. It, it depends on the LEDs. If you're just running... One little one, absolutely. Um, and that's probably true for a 9-volt battery as well. Honestly, they do not take a whole lot of current. If you're running the Arduino with it, those can draw, I want to say, up to about 100 milliamps. So it might take a little bit longer, but those are very, very efficient. The danger is that they also can be punctured and start big fires. Oh, so if really? You're going to even the little some, ones? Even the little ones, which is pretty unfortunate. That's why there's so many regulations around them. You can't ship them to certain places, can't bring them on airplanes. And that's just because... They're squishy. If you stab them, they explode. Also true of humans. 
I know. So weird. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> so, so something to think about if you're, if you're working with this with kids and you're doing mm-hmm. things with screwdrivers and uh, soldering irons and things that could either puncture or heat up these little packets, these very convenient sources of power, but definitely volatile. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So honestly, a nine volt battery might be an okay place to start if it's a short term project. Okay. That's super, that's super helpful. Gosh. Well, I really appreciate you chatting with me today. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's it's been fun. We've got a new project to go try. Uh, seriously, like you make this happen, and I'm going to tell everyone because that would be amazing. Because I'm looking to buy a new TV, and um, I would love to totally hell if I could get the entire house pulsing with like LED colors, you know, based on what's on the screen. Oh my goodness, that would be a super project. So yeah, I'm excited to hear what you uh, to see what you what you make with that. Mm-hmm, definitely. All right. This has been another episode of Hansel Minutes, and we'll see you again next week. Mm-hmm.